Welcome to Babel, Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. The Saudi film industry has changed dramatically in the last five years. In 2018, cinemas were banned. Today, the production of films and entertainment occupy a central role in the country's Vision 2030 agenda. To break down these massive shifts in the Saudi film industry and what it all means for the future, I sit down with Hannah Lomer, a Saudi writer and director. Then, I continue the conversation with Will Todman and Danny Sharp, discussing the future of the Saudi film industry and why Hollywood blockbusters remain so popular in Saudi Arabia and the rest of the region. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Hannah Lomer is chair of the Saudi Cinema Association. She's a writer and a director, and her series Whispers was released on Netflix in 2020. Hannah, welcome to Babel. Thank you, John. You were working as a journalist when you won an award in 2008 for writing a movie script for Hadaf about a Saudi girl who dreams of being a professional soccer player. Why did you write a movie script when your country had no theaters? Yeah, I always felt that I'm a writer. I've tried several times writing different genres, different short stories. I was planning to write a novel at one point, but I always felt that there is another form of creative writing that I would like to explore. Till the moment that I wrote a screenplay and that I said to myself, this is it, this is what I want to write. And it was a surprise that it won a prize at that time. But I think this was a sign for me to keep going into that direction. How big was the Saudi film industry in 2008? It was almost non-existent, except of a few trials here and there of short films. Of course, every maybe seven years or so, there will be produced a Saudi film. But this was not considered by any means an industry or even a movement or anything. But how big is it now? Now it's much, much bigger. I believe that during this year, around 11 feature films had been produced. And by the end of the year, maybe even more. And how many people are in it? Who are they? Give us a sense for this community, if you would. Well, the people who work right now in the industry, most of them had been there for a while. Like, for example, Mahmoud Sabah, he already made two films, Baraka Meets Baraka and Amra, The Second Marriage. And now he just finished making his third feature. So he's been there for a while. But there are others who are doing their first feature films. And we expect more and more names coming into the industry as it goes, you know, with the funding, with all of the other things happening at the moment. I believe we're going to see more of newcomers. And how many people are there? How many Saudis are involved making films? I would say hundreds. I remember talking about the percentage of females when I made my first uh, documentary in 2009. I was the only female on set. And then in 2014, when I made my first short fiction film, Shekwa, it was me and the main actress only. And when I was doing Whispers, it was around 50% of the crew were women. And the cast uh, were more women than men. So you can see how things are improving by just looking at the numbers. Who are the figures in your family who are supportive of your exploring this for a career? And were there people in your family who had reservations about your pursuing this kind of career? I can say that I've been extremely lucky that my family didn't interfere. At the beginning, they were confused. I mean, I'm doing something very weird for them, making films when there are no cinemas, there's nothing. I was teaching in the university at one point, and then I left and started working as a freelancer and not having a proper job. And this all is 
very weird according to all the social norms. But they have accepted whatever I'm doing. They gave me my own space. And gradually, I mean, my mother would watch all my interviews. She would record them. Sometimes she will send it to her friends. And more and more, they see that I've been following something. It's a path and there is a career right now for me where it wasn't before. They started to realize that and tell me that it was the right thing to do for you. But of course, it took a while (laughs) to prove that. I understand you had a grandfather who also helped shape your direction here. Yes, my grandfather is a great influence. He's one of the first people who were educated. He actually had a degree as a graduate from India when there were no schools in Saudi Arabia. So he was one of the first teachers in Saudi. And then he opened the first bookstore in the eastern province. And books were his life. So every single time he would go to a book fair and buy books, he would come to me with a gift. And the gift is always a book, a story. And this is where I started to love stories. What kinds of stories are you trying to tell right now? What stories do you think it's important for Saudi filmmakers to tell? I think we have a very rich heritage that we did not show to the world. We have a great heritage full of stories that hadn't been told in terms of history, in terms of all the changes that we went through. And all of this is very inspiring for us as filmmakers to go and to explore more. I always love, in particular, relationships and how complicated relationships are. But also, I love to show things that I would have loved to see on screen about our women, our men as well. Even men in Saudi had been only portrayed in a certain way, a very cliche that is not right. I've been supported all my life by men. My grandfather, my father, my brother, my ex-husband, you know, they've been, they've been supportive in many different ways. Uh, so it's not the way that people would think about when it comes to Saudi men. How do you think about taboos? Which taboos do you think are important to portray in film? And which taboos do you think shouldn't be portrayed in film? I think you can portray everything if you know how to treat the sensitivity of it. Because if you understand the sensitivity and then you work around it, you can always do whatever you want and say whatever you want to say without being shocking to people. And I don't like to shock people. But I like to work into ways that hadn't been tackled or discussed. For example, we have a certain respect for parents. And it's said that they are always right, but they're not. You know, they're human beings. So they make mistakes and sometimes very big mistakes and maybe damaging to their children without realizing that they are doing this. So in Shekwa, The father was not a good father at all. And the daughter had to deal with her father. But at the end, there was a moment when she realized that this father is now in a very different stage. He is a helpless person. And when he gave her just a nod of appreciation, things started to change. So in a way, it's something that you can consider a very sensitive issue. But at the same time, I've seen people greatly affected by it and really understood what's going on in the story. So I believe that you can always say whatever you want to say. I'd be interested in how you think about your audience. You have a domestic audience. You have a regional audience. With Netflix, you have a global audience. Are you trying to address all three of them? And do you think that sometimes when you have such a diverse audience, the message can get garbled? Yes, I think you need to specify a certain audience and then pray that it will work with the other audiences because it's extremely difficult sometimes. And when we were doing Whispers, we were hoping that Netflix would buy them because at the beginning they were interested, but they said, 
let's see first. And then at the time, they didn't have any Saudi original production. And therefore, they were a bit skeptical that it would be the type of story that they want to have. And they said, we are interested, but let's see once you start shooting. So we were not sure where it's going to be. And we just worked with the story. And for me, it was the story I'm going to follow. And at the beginning of the story or the show, we have someone dying from an accident. And the family of the guy who died start to have a strange calls and therefore suspect that there's something behind this accident and it might be a crime. It might not be just a normal accident. And every single time we see this story, we see it from a, a certain perspective. And as we go on from one episode to the other, we gradually see the whole picture and we start to realize who is behind this crime. And so this is almost the Saudi version of Rashomon. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> I'm a fan of Rashomon. <laughs> it's one of my favorite films, actually. There's a lot of Saudi government support for filmmaking now. What do you think the government needs to do to support the industry? And what should the government avoid doing so it doesn't distort the industry's development? Well, the government is doing a lot for the industry, and it's an open discussion. We always have forums with the Film Commission, with the Ministry of Culture. We've been included in the decision-making so that whatever is done is done to help the people who are in the industry and make sure that everything they need is there. Right now, there is the Association of Film, which is different from the Cinema Association. And the Film Association, it's like a guild. So they're working on regulating a lot of stuff to make sure that the rights of people in the industry is watched and is monitored. This is very, very important. So we're looking forward and this will make a big difference for everybody who's in the industry. We have a lot of funds, which is great. We've been looking for that. But there are still things that need to be done regarding permits for shooting. We are still a new industry. And when you work on film, you need a lot of other services to help the industry. It's not only the industry itself. You need hotels, you need cars, you need transportation, catering, lots of other things. And so you need people to work with you. And people in Saudi are not really acquainted with our industry. So we are still trying to include people in to educate them about our needs and how we can collaborate and how we can work together. This will take some time, of course, but we're getting there. And it's just a matter of time. What are your upcoming projects? I have one project that is so dear to me. I've been working on for quite a few years right now. It's an adaptation of a Saudi novel, Divers of the Desert, written by a female Saudi novelist, Amal Faran. And I've been working on it from 2019 till now. And it had been last year in the market of the Red Sea Film Festival. And we're planning to actually produce it 2024. So 2024, hopefully. <laughs> we will look for it. Hannah Lomer, thank you very much for joining us on Babel. Thank you. Thank you, John. Saudi Arabia is just getting started with film, but the region writ large has a rich legacy of filmmaking from Egypt to Iran. Those films often reflect their environment. Iranian film, for example, relies heavily on symbolism and suggestion to make serious points that might otherwise land the filmmakers in trouble. Given Saudi Arabia's trajectory under MBS, what kind of environment do you think will emerge for filmmaking and art more generally? So I think the first thing to keep in mind is that Iran has a literary culture that Saudi Arabia really doesn't have. There's a culture of poetry, and there's been a tension in recent years to pre-Islamic poetry in Saudi Arabia, but it is not a deeply literary place. And I think that the film industry you're going to see is not going to be a deeply literary film industry. I think it will be engaging. I think it will be commercial. 
And I think it will be interestingly pan-Arab. Already to do films in Saudi Arabia, you need international film crew, an international Arab film crew. And what I think you're going to see is not so much a literary style coming out of Saudi Arabia, but you're going to see Saudi Arabia becoming more of an entrepot, the way Dubai has become a sort of entrepot for business. Riyadh is trying to become an entrepot for business. I think you're going to see Saudi Arabia trying to become that kind of place in cultural production, things that are appealing to broad audiences, things that stretch the boundaries of what Saudis are used to seeing. I think one of the questions a lot of people have is will be shrinking boundaries in a lot of the rest of the Arab world. We certainly saw a period 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, when Saudi cultural production was really trying to shrink the boundaries in places like Egypt, in places like Lebanon. Where that new balance falls, I'm not really sure. But I think that the potential upside of all of this is the Saudis are serious about increasing Arabic and Arab arts production. They have the money to do it. And throughout the Arab world, you may see creative people who have opportunities because of Saudi Arabia's interest in this that five years ago you certainly wouldn't have seen. And that can help Egyptians, it can help Lebanese, it can help a whole range of people. What we still don't know is on what issues, if any, does it end up curtailing freedoms? I was really interested by Hannah's views about taboos and taboos in Saudi cinema. Her answer was essentially about children disobeying their parents. And this is taboo that a lot of people in the US and elsewhere might not immediately think of when they think of taboos in Saudi Arabia. We probably would immediately think of anything that's anti-religious, something that's overtly political. But there are certainly changing norms when it comes to the relationships within families. And I think this is going to be such an interesting area for Saudi cinema to look at. And it's not completely new, right? I mean, when I think of Saudi film, I think of Wajda, which was a film from the early 2010s about a little girl who really wants to ride a bike. And it's really a beautiful film. And there are really interesting relationships between women in, in the film. And this was made entirely in Saudi Arabia at a time when women couldn't drive when certainly a lot of the focus when you thought about Saudi Arabia was the lack of rights for women. And yet this film was made. And so I do think artists have already found really interesting ways to comment on very sensitive social issues, changing social issues. And I wrote a piece a couple of months ago about how Saudi artists are contributing to the conversation about environmental issues in Saudi Arabia. And artists are finding ways to comment and to criticize the government indirectly for its water management policies, for example. And so I think for those people trying to understand Saudi Arabia, this is going to be an exciting avenue to watch. One of the interesting things to me is that you clearly have a leadership that is trying to liberalize the country. The question is, if you have an artistic community that the leadership feels is going too far, where does that balance fall? Is it going to be about degree of change? Is it going to be about pace of change? Is it going to be about direction of change? And how does the government try to steer that evolution? But as Will says, I think it's absolutely true. And as Hannah suggested, this is going to be an area that, that bears watching. It is hard to imagine. It's not going to be consequential. But when John and I were in the kingdom last summer, Top Gun Maverick was absolutely the movie of the moment. Is U.S. entertainment as popular elsewhere in the region? And how do foreign and domestic entertainment options coexist or compete for attention? So, yes, U.S. films are very popular. I think in Damascus right now, you can see Mission Impossible. You can probably see Oppenheimer. Not so sure about Barbie. But there is a genre of Hollywood action movies that continues to be extremely popular across the region. There is an ongoing interest from Middle Eastern audiences for blockbuster Hollywood movies. 
is there a major Middle Eastern audience for some of the movies that Hollywood produces that are touching on more sensitive issues, social issues? No, not so much, right? Of course, there are pockets of interest there. But to me, I think you see a lot of interest in comedy that's produced in the region, particularly from Egypt. But I think there are different kind of categories of movies that attract an audience. And ultimately, as we've discussed on Babel before, just because Hollywood movies are popular in the Middle East does not mean then that Middle Eastern audiences automatically have a very favorable view of the United States. You know, it's a really complicated relationship between a Hollywood movie and the soft power of the U.S. When I was in the U.S. government right after 9-11, there was a lot of talk about how the U.S. can win hearts and minds. And there was a little bit of awe that Hollywood was so good at storytelling and, and the stories that Hollywood tells are so popular, not only in the Middle East, but around the world. And there was a little sense of how do we bottle that and how do we get the U.S. government's message out through using that medium? How do we partner with Hollywood? Whatever. I mean, all kinds of crazy ideas, only some of which were carried out. But I think Hollywood has figured out some really universal ways to tell stories. Action films don't require a lot of education. They don't require language ability. And Hollywood is good at making money. And one of the ways they make money is appealing to lots and lots of audiences. In some ways, the secret that Hollywood has that the U.S. government doesn't have is Hollywood's not really trying to send a message. Hollywood's trying to make money. And the U.S. government isn't trying to make money. It's trying to send a message. And those things are kind of different. But certainly you have Netflix in the Middle East. You have Arab satellite television channels that are broadcasting American series, American films. I still remember being shocked when I went and visited MBC, the Middle East Broadcasting Corporation in London, in 1998. And one of their very popular comedy series that they put out was a series in the 90s in the United States called Mad About You, about a Jewish guy in a New York apartment with his non-Jewish wife in their first years of marriage. And I remember thinking, this is really a narrow sliver of American life. <laughs> how do Arabs, how do Saudis relate to it? And the reality is, there are universal aspects to even the most particular stories. And that was a popular series in the late 90s in the Middle East, as it was a popular series in the United States. And the fact that there are these universal stories that we don't think of as universal was striking to me. And part of it is, is the genius to say, here's the universal strand in that story. I think this can resonate. You know, we did an interview a while back on Babel with Fadi Ismail, who is the person who brought Turkish soap operas to the Arab world. There's something about being able to see the universal appeal that is as important as being able to create something with universal appeal is spotting it and saying, this makes sense, this resonates with people. Looking forward to seeing how the Saudis will tell their own stories. John and Will, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Danny. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for listening to Babbel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSIS website, and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast. 